Welcome to week five of Nursing 301, Chapter 71. This week we're going to be covering fundamentals of pediatric nursing. So what is um, pediatrics? Pediatrics is, of course, the area of care that deals with children and adolescents. And pediatric nurses, we provide care for <coughs> children, whether they're well, ill, physically challenged, or mentally challenged. We also provide care for family or other primary care providers that are part of the situations that involve children. Pediatric nursing can be delivered in a lot of different healthcare settings. It can be delivered in the home. It can be delivered in the community. It can be delivered, be delivered in day surgery centers, healthcare provider offices, summer camps, residential settings, or hospitals. And the primary emphasis in pediatric healthcare is on the prevention of disease and accidents, maintenance of good health, safety awareness, and a positive lifestyle promotion. Health maintenance. Like I said, the goal of pediatrics is prevention of diseases, disorders, and disabilities. For health maintenance, they have to have well baby and well child visits, as that's the most effective method of promoting the growth and development of healthy children. It is important to have routine scheduled trips to their primary health care provider or to the community health facilities. Um, health maintenance monitors growth rates and achievements of developmental milestones. It provides opportunities for early detection of health problems, which can lead to preventative treatment. Health maintenance also provides an opportunity for nurses to provide teaching about health, safety, and nutrition issues. During well child visits, they're going to do like vital signs, height and weight, the occipital frontal circumference, or OFC, of the head to three years of age, abdominal girth and limb measurements, plot and chart on growth chart, and we're going to compare that to other children of the same age. The one thing we have to remember is not all children are the same, so, you know, but we are going to compare them to children of the same age. Various tools that we can utilize to assess child development. There is a Denver 2 developmental screening test or the DDST and that is used to identify developmental delays in infants, toddlers, and preschools schoolers. And there's also the Hawaii Early Learning Profile or HELP which helps determine a child's developmental level. Um, remember the Denver 2 Developmental Screening Test, or the DDST, is used to identify developmental delays in infants, toddlers, and preschoolers. The physical exam, the primary caregiver, will either do a head-to-toe checklist or a body system approach. Um, my recommendation is choose one you're comfortable with and always stick with it because that way you will not miss anything. Um, you know, a physical exam, exception to the established normal trends, are noted and described in detail on the child's chart. So immunizations. Immunizations provide temporary or permanent protection against certain diseases. Immunizations begin shortly after the child's birth and should be continued on a regular schedule. Family caregivers must present records of immunizations to the child's school. Failure to do so may result in the child's exclusion from school. Nursing considerations related to immunizations. Remember, federal law requires that healthcare workers provide a vaccine information sheet or a VIS to cl uh, the client, the parents, or legal representatives before each dose of certain vaccines. And the VIS um, is a sheet that explains the benefits and risk of the vaccines. Remember, immunizations are important to the child as well as society. And it's important as nurses to know the recommended immunization schedules 
the immunizations and the schedules that children should receive their immunizations. So um, there is a chart in your book regarding immunizations that I recommend that you look at. So um, just take a look at that and it'll give you all the different immunizations in their age groups that they should receive those immunizations. Specific care for age groups. A nurse has to keep in mind that the age of the child and the expected behaviors for that age group. So for infant care, there are specific observations that we make. Um, equal active movement of all extremities. What is their general activity level? What is their alertness? Their skin, color, warmth, and texture. What is the tone and pitch of the infant's cry? Those are specific observations that we make. General observations for infants is how is the infant held by the caregiver? If the infant cuddles with the caregivers, you know, how do they cuddle with the caregivers? The cleanliness of the infant, the infant's response to painful procedures, and the child's appearance. You know, their weight compared to their length. For toddler care, we went um, document, following his documentation for a well child checkup. What age did they wean from the breast or the bottle to the cup? It's usually achieved by 12 months of age. Some children are a little earlier, some are a little bit later. At what age were they toilet trained? And when did it, how old were they when they, it was started? And how old was it when it was completed? What is their language development like? What are their play patterns and activities? What are their sleep patterns? We want to discuss the child's behavior patterns with their caregivers and the type of discipline used at home. We also want to encourage dental checkups. And for nurses, our teaching is gonna focus on safety because you know toddlers are mobile and they lack judgment to protect themselves. And then we also want to observe the caregiver-toddler interaction. Preschoolers. Preschoolers, we focus on readiness for school. Again, we focus on sleep patterns and safety. What are their relationships with peers, siblings, and family caregivers? We want to document their ability to pay attention, their ability to follow directions, and how they focus on a task. We also want to evaluate their speech, hearing, and vision because it ha should be within normal limits to facilitate learning and is the child's developmental age equal to their chronological age? What is their attention span? Most toddlers, preschoolers, their attention span is about five minutes. You may get 10, but it's usually between five and 10. You know, um, how are their gross and fine motor skills? For school-age children, we're going to evaluate their nutrition, elimination, and sleep patterns. We're going to review their immunization status, and we're going to plot their height and weight on a growth chart and compare it to children, other children of the same age. Um, specific care for um, adolescent care. We want to make sure that we reserve preserve their self-respect and identity. We want to provide clear, non-biased, and accurate information. And we want to provide um, education regarding STDs. We want to focus on puberty and the transitioning to young adulthood. We need to up make sure their DT is updated. And it's really beneficial to talk separately with the caregivers and the adolescents. It is very, very beneficial to talk separately with the caregivers and the adolescents. Also, um, 
Remember that illness or injury can seriously threaten their self-image. We want to respect their modesty and realize they need clear, non-judgmental information about substance use and abuse, depression, and suicide. There is a key concept on page 1166 in the left column. Adolescents may be too embarrassed to ask questions, particularly about their health. A bulletin board or brochure rack well stocked with informational pamphlets about common concerns can aid in communication. Remember, adolescents may be too embarrassed to ask questions, particularly about their health. A bulletin board or brochure rack well stocked with informational pamphlets about common concerns can aid communication. The hospital experience for children. Age-related concerns is um, therapeutic communication. Remember, the hospital experience can be traumatic for everyone regardless of their age. And remember, pediatric nurses provide care not for the sick not only for the sick child, but for the entire family. Ages one to five often exhibit um, severe anxiety when separated from family or home. They often misinterpret what they hear. We want to keep sentences short and phrase statements so the child knows what to do or what not to, or what to avoid. Younger school age children may experience fear of separation when ill. So on page 1166 under age-related concerns, there are some statements there um, that give an example of what a child might be thinking compared to um, when it's compared to how you say it. So just take a look through those statements and the examples that are given in the book. Just remember to keep your sentences short and phrase statements so the child knows what to do, not what to avoid. And family-centered care. You want to encourage family to remain with the children, assure the child caregiver will return, provide nurturing measures to reduce anxiety. Preparation. You know, give tours if you were able to. Um, the goal is to help children successfully adjust, tell them what to expect, and help them avoid feeling abandoned or punished. Let them bring a special item with them. Separation anxiety and loss of control. Um, children, they feel threatened and unsafe. Often, it's a panic reaction. Their behaviors may include crying, resisting attention or treatment and screaming. So, and sometimes too, what we have to remember is the child's inability to maintain newly learned concepts associated with autonomy, such as walking, potty training, or feeding oneself. There are three stages of separation anxiety. Those are protest, despair, and denial. Those are located on in your book on page 1167 in box 71-2. And protest, that is um, crying, rejection of new caregivers, fear of the unknown, and anxiety cause a child to demand their own caregivers. So, um, you know, the child's need for family caregivers is, a, is conscious conscious and sorrowful. So remember, um, protest, they will cry, they, re they will reject new caregivers, they have the, a fear of the unknown. With despair, the child becomes inactive and sad, they will use comfort measures such as thumb sucking, clutching a blanket, may become more prominent, they watch constantly for their caregivers. They become quiet and withdrawn 
and uninterested in food or play. And then denial or detachment phase um, may be interpreted as a sign the child is protecting themselves from anxiety by rejecting family caregivers. Child's need for caregivers is more intense than ever. I really want you to pay attention to protest and despair and know the difference between those two. So um, with despair, they watch constantly for their family caregivers. They're quiet and withdrawn. Or they become uninterested in food or play. And they usually will seek comfort measures such as thumb sucking and clutching a blanket. Where in protest, they will cry and react aggressively and reject healthcare personnel. They have fear of the unknown and anxiety cause a child to demand their own caregivers. This reaction is normal and denotes a healthy attachment to the caregivers. Another thing that we have to take into consideration is transcultural considerations especially if the culture is different. Do we have language barriers? We can use picture books to communicate and allow them to be around other children if able. The one thing I want you to remember is, and it's very important, is a smile is a universal language. How can we reduce anxiety in children? For, you know, just general guidelines, how can we reduce their anxiety and help to calm children for different procedures? We can explain the procedure and results in terms that the child can understand. Never tell the child something will not hurt if it might. Use the examination or treatment room. Never tell a child not to cry. Crying is a normal response to pain and fear. Give an analgesic before a painful procedure if possible. Check the child's condition frequently. And document any unusual reactions. Admitting children to the healthcare facility. Be, make sure you're alert to the needs of both the family caregivers and the child. You want to make the family members as comfortable and secure as possible. It is important to learn, earn their confidence and cooperation. Ask about special needs of the child. Ask about the child's likes and dislikes, any type of allergies. Does the child use a special vocabulary? And remember, in a healthcare setting, the playroom should is a non-threatening environment. The playroom is a non-threatening environment. So you always want to make sure that you use the examination room or treatment room if you're giving medications or anything like that because their playroom should be a non-threatening environment. Assisting with the physical exam. You can show the child the equipment and let them hold, handle it to promote a sense of control. And because the utmost important is to get the child's cooperation. You can use, only use restraints as a last resort because restraints mil, um, make children feel more threatened and frightened. And when assisting with the physical exam, you can collect most of your admission data for a small child while they sit on the caregiver's lap. When assisting with the physical exam, you can collect most of the admission data for a small child while they sit on the caregiver's lap. What, I, um, what data do we collect? We collect vital signs. Um, first off, you know, when with vital signs, you want to take the respirations before taking any other vital signs. 
because you're unable to get accurate respirations if the child is crying and you need to count it for one full minute. If you're unable to obtain respiratory rate, observe for signs of respiratory distress, check their skin color, their pallor, and presence of breath sounds. Remember, take respirations before taking other vital signs and count for one full minute. Their pulse, over age two, you can do a radial. Less than two, an apical, and you wanna count for one full minute. An infant's pulse should be between 80 and 180. So an infant's pulse should be between 80 and 180, and you wanna count for one full minute. Temperatures. Over age six, you can do oral or tympanic. Less than six, you can do tympanic, axillary, rectal. Um, so, yes, okay. So just, re you know, um, but you do not want to do a rectal temp if the child has had any immune or hematological disorders or if they've had rectal surgeries or diarrhea. So remember, no rectal temps if the child has had any immune or hematological disorder, rectal surgeries, or diarrhea. And no tympanic temperatures if the child has had ear surgery, tubes, or infection. Their height and weight. You always want to weigh on admission. With an infant, you want to weigh before feeding, balance the scale without clothes and diapers. You want to measure their weight in kilograms because it allows for accurate dosage calculations for medication administration. Make sure you report any deviations in weight. You want to observe for any signs of edema, dehydration, and their nutritional status. You um, also want to use disposable tape, paper tape for height because cloth tape can stretch. So you want to use disposable paper tape for height because cloth tapes can stretch. Their blood pressure when choosing a cuff, the cuff should cover two-thirds of the upper arm and use the same size each time. If you take their blood pressure on their thigh, make sure that you document that it was taken on the thigh. So remember, respirations take before any other vital signs and count for one full minute. And pulse, less than age two, is apical. And you want to count for one full minute. And an infant's pulse should be between 80 and 180. Also, you want to observe for any signs of a rash, abrasions, discharges, or alterations in LOC, and note any complaint, and make sure you document all your observations. The head circumference. This is for children up to three years of age or any child with a head size in question. The occipital frontal circumference, or the OCF, excuse me, reflects intracranial volume pressure. Factors that can affect um, the OFC are brain development, intracranial pressure, hydrocephalus, brain tumors, congenital defects. Chest circumference. You want to measure and compare the child's chest circumference with the occipital frontal circumference. Newborns, their head is much larger than their chest. Children one to two, their chest and head are approximately equal. By age five, the chest is two to three inches larger than the head. Children one to two, their chest and head are approximately equal. Other measurements, you can do abdominal circumference. You want to do that at the umbilicus. Extremity length and circumference. Just always make sure you document where you took the circumference. 
So chest circumference. Children ages one to two, their chest and head are approximately equal. You want to observe and document any normal behavior and reactions, any abnormal symptoms, unfavorable signs, and nonverbal signals, such as if they're pulling at their ears. Diet. You want to document their eyes and nose. You want to document intake of all types of food and output of all types, such as stool, emesis, voiding, drainage. If it's an infant, make sure you weigh their diapers. General appearance, what is their activity level? Their skin color, warmth, comfort level. Um, what is their response to the environment? What is their respiratory status? Family caregiver comments. You know, because family caregivers often notice signs others may miss. Make sure you document the family caregiver's comments. Physical signs, changes in vital signs, changes in the cough, congestion, wheezing, nasal discharge, or rash. Visitors, do they have lack of visitors? If they have lack of visitors, that may indicate that there are family problems. When children are discharged from the hospital, they're normally taken home by their family caregivers who are responsible for their follow-up care. So make sure that you teach the family caregivers the follow-up care and document this teaching. And all states require placement of children in a car seat or safety restraining devices. Pediatric safety and infection control. You want to explain to caregivers and the child what you're doing and why. Oh, sorry about that. That's not where I wanted to start. You want to follow standard and transmission-based precautions as appropriate. You want to make sure that beds are in low position and the side rails are up. Because as nurses, we are legally responsible for the safety of the children that are in our care. We want to support children when they're carried or transferred. Never leave any child younger than 10 years of age alone in any amount of water. Use safety restraints when transporting a child. Supervise ambulatory children. And never prop bottles. Safety devices. We want to explain to the caregivers and the child what we're doing and why. Be sure the child does not view the restraint as punishment. The different types of safety, device, um, safety devices are listed on page 1173 and 1174. There is a jacket device. And... Um, you want to apply this over clothing or gowns. You want to make sure that you check their circulation every one to two hours. Allow the child to exercise and prevent skin breakdown. There is a clove hitch restraint, which is a curlix bandage or a stocking net applied in a figure eight knot. You want to check the extremities every hour for circulation and remove every two hours for exercise. Mummy device that is used to restrain the entire body with a small blanket and only the head is exposed. Papoose is a plastic frame to which a child can be strapped to. It's uncomfortable. Um, a lot of times they will use it for circumcision. Arm boards, they're used to prevent IV to protect IV sites, I meant. So arm boards are used to protect IV sites and you wanna make sure you pad the board with washcloths or a small towel and fasten with tape. So arm boards used to protect IV sites and you wanna pad the board with washcloths or a small towel and fasten with tape. Mitts or gloves that prevents them from pulling or scratching at tubes. Mitts 
prevents scratching or pulling at tubes. But please be aware restraints can be the cause of damage or even death if used inappropriately. In or, um, you need a physician's order for um, to use restraints. And when if you do have to use restraints, always release and reapply every one to two hours. Check their skin and circulation and document, document, document. Infection control. You want to follow standard and transmission-based precautions as appropriate. You want to use disposable gowns and change your gown at least once each shift. Change your gowns at least once each shift and more often if needed. Scrub before and after removing the gown and always wear your gloves. Nutrient intake, nutrition. You want to record all food and fluid consumed by the child. Always supervise children who are eating. Fluids, you can offer small amounts frequently. You can give them ice pops, ice cream, gelatin, soda, fruit drinks. And some children may get receive gavage feedings. They may have a gavage button. They may receive bolus feedings or continuous feedings via a kangaroo pump. And par parental fluid administration. Just remember 65 to 80 percent of children's weight is water. And that children can dehydrate more, much more easily than adults. But also too much fluid can be very dangerous for children, so use an infusion pump. Other pediatric procedures that we may um, assist in. Elimination. Use disposable diapers. Collecting a urine specimen. Use a pediatric urine bag. Catheterizing the children. Remember, it, it only catheterize if it is absolutely necessary because it can cause distress and damage and delicate and damage delicate structures it can also cause UTIs so only catheterize if absolutely necessary administering enemas oral laxatives are preferred if it's absolutely necessary an enema can be given but do not use tap water enemas because they can cause fluid and electrolyte imbalances and dehydration. Using suppositories for drugs such as Tylenol, anticonvulsives, and anti-nausea medications. You want to lubricate it before insertion and hold it in place by gently pressing on the anal sphincter from the outside until the, the child no longer feels the urge to expel it. Treating diarrhea. Remember our main concern is dehydration and spread of disease, so we want to take quick preventative measures. Daily cleanliness. Before we give them a bath, we want to make sure we gather all our supplies first. We want to weigh them before their bath. And we want to cleanse our eyes first and go from inner to outer. And oral, for oral hygiene, we can either wipe their gums down with a damp washcloth or gauze after each feeding. Administering oxygen. There are various ways to administer oxygen. Isolator incubator, nasal cannula, mask, mist tent, hood, intermittent positive pressure breathing devices. Um, this is all on page 1177. On page 1178, table 71-2 has ver the different methods of oxygen administration. The one thing is administering oxygen. Too much oxygen can be toxic. 
and it can lead to lung damage. Too little may not be effective, so we have to monitor them very, very closely because if they have a fast respiratory rate and then it becomes too slow, they're becoming tired and they're at risk of respiratory arrest. So with, uh, especially with babies and small children, their respiratory status can change quickly and early signs can be difficult to see. Resuscitation. Emergency drugs are calculated according to body weight. If you don't have an accurate body weight, and on the pediatric code card, there is a Braslow tape, which is a color coded based on the length of the child. And diversion and recreation. Play is important. It is considered an aspect of growth and development. Play can be used to teach children and prepare them for clinical procedures. Um, you know, children usually regress during illnesses, so we really want to um, take that into consideration. And you do want to avoid using the television for being a babysitter. And then advanced pediatric care and procedures, diagnostic procedures, um, venipuncture. That is a preferred site. It is a form femoral thigh area. You want to apply pressure times five minutes and monitor the site every 15 minutes times one hour. So venipuncture, preferred site is the femoral thigh area. And you want to apply pressure times five minutes and monitor that site every 15 minutes times one hour. Heel stick, blood samples, apply a disposable heel warmer first. Lumbar punctures, you want to hold with their back curved and always monitor the site afterwards. Therapeutic procedures, managing a fever, if their temperature is 100, greater than 104, immediate action is necessary. Do not give aspirin. Sponge with lukewarm water and do not use alcohol or ice. If their temperature is less than 102, keep the child quiet, prevent crying, and encourage fluids. If their temperature is less than 102 degrees, keep the child quiet, prevent crying, and encourage fluids. Giving medication administrations, always, always, always check their ID band because there are more opportunities to, for errors to occur with infants and children. Remember, their dosages and routes may differ. Know all the side effects of each drug being administered. Always double check your calculations and use the smallest syringe possible to ensure accuracy. Use the smallest syringe possible to ensure accuracy. If a child is having surgery, note any untoward signs. Normal ranges of vital signs differ with age. Children need analgesia, analgesia appropriate for their body size after surgery. The rapid rate of metabolism and growth in children increases the healing ability of their tissues. Children become dehydrated very quickly as their electrolytes are not stable as they are in adults. A high metabolic rate dictates a high caloric intake. Also, consider the family caregivers and their emotional needs and just always take into consideration your teaching measures. Teaching of care measures is vital. 
And any different, if you notice anything um, that's abnormal, always make sure you make your physician aware and document. Child having surgery, um, pre-op care, what are we going to do? We're going to, of course, get them pre prepared for surgery. Nursing observations, we're going to chart the presence of any open wounds, rashes, or any other unusual conditions. We're going to observe and document any signs of upper respiratory infection. If they show signs of an upper respiratory infection, that may cause a delay in surgery. Immediate measures before surgery is you need their weight and their vital signs. Remember, immediate measures before surgery, you need their weight and a current set of vital signs. You want to make sure they are kept NPO and make sure the parents have signed the consent form. So immediate measures before surgery is to make sure you have their weight and a current set of vital signs. Post-op care, reorient the child to the room. We're going to check vital signs. We're going to check that operative site. We're going to monitor the flow of the IVs. We're going to notify the family when the child returns to the room. We're also going to evaluate their pain and discomfort. And then we're going to document thoroughly and report accurately. That is the end of Chapter 71, Fundamentals of Pediatric Nursing. Um, have a great week, guys. Your quiz for Chapter 7, and, I mean not 7, your quiz for Chapter 70 and Chapter 9 is open on Socrative. And your sign-on for it is NSGFON301. Have a great week and a great weekend.